Mr. Kant needs no introduction, was CEO of Niti Aayog and now, of course, uh, India's uh, Sherpa to the G20, very important time globally for India. And you've just come back from uh, the G20 summit that was, of course, uh, held in Indonesia and in Bali. And that, of course, was uh, an event where India got the baton as we move forward into uh, 2023 as the presidency. Now, a lot was said about the manner in which uh, India affected a sort of diplomatic coup by getting common agreement or breaking common ground on uh, the final agreement. How did that happen? Because anything you say will, of course, be news. Uh, so, Rahul, this was a very, very complex period because uh, throughout Indonesian presidency, that is throughout the year, there were about 200 meetings held. There were about 15 ministerials held. None of them uh, could arrive at a communique. All of them actually had failed. And it was broadly perceived that the final leader's communique will not arrive at. Uh, so when we landed up in Bali, there was huge discussion. And uh, the geopolitics was such that uh, the, because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, G20 is not a political body. It's an economic body. Uh, it discusses finance and many other things, but G7 said that it has huge implications for fuel, fertilizer, uh, energy, and therefore they drafted a very, very political statement. Uh, 19 out of 20 pages were condemning uh, Russia, and therefore that was not ex acceptable to Russia. So India played a very key and a very critical role because the Prime Minister had told us that please ensure that Indonesia uh, gets a communique sort out the problem on the in Indonesia, don't bring the problem to India. And therefore, India joined hands with Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, Argentina, uh, Saudi joined us, Singapore joined us, everybody joined us. And then we finally con had to convince G7 that we need a balanced statement. And we drafted the preamble to that uh, entire, what is called as the Shepo para. We drafted it and we said that instead of making it political, let's bring in the UN resolution. So the UN resolution as it was, which had been voted, we, we, read, we brought in sentences from there and brought out the statement and that was acceptable uh, to G7 and finally because of the pressure of uh, the emerging markets we could both ensure that G7 accepts it, Russia accepts it, China accepts it. So India played a very positive, very progressive, very forward-looking approach. It brought consensus amongst everyone and emerged as a true leader there. So India's role was very critical and that was because of the directions given by the Prime Minister. And finally we had to see that this was acceptable to the leaders all the leaders across all countries accepted it. G20 approved it. Uh, the Leaders Summit approved it. And just two days back, the APEC Summit, which is not where India is not a member, has copied that particular para ad verbatim. So what India could draft has been accepted widely all over. Now, specifically, uh, in, uh, in the media, United States representatives came out, in fact, government representatives have come out, ministers have come out, or the equivalent of secretaries there came out and said that the Prime Minister himself played a role in this. So, you're being charitable, he spelled out the vision, but he also apparently did some talk. So, whatever was done, whatever was done was because of the Prime Minister. He is not only his vision, his constant direction, he had spelled out uh, the broad... Uh, parameters, negotiation, and finally convincing all the leaders. Because at last stage, uh, there was also this fear that these leaders will back out of it because there was a challenge from both Russia's side, there was a challenge from G7 side. Uh, all the leaders, the G7 met in Bali again, and there was a challenge that they'll back out. But Prime Minister had individual meetings with everyone, each one of these leaders, starting with Macron, the Indonesian president, the, uh, Mr. Bush, each one of them. And he managed to convince everybody that, this can, that the world needs to move forward. The world leaders uh, have to play a very positive role in br bringing peace and harmony. But more important than that, uh, it's important to realize that because of the COVID era, 200 million people have gone below poverty lines, 75 
five million people have lost their jobs and it's the responsibility of the leaders to take the world forward. So he played a very key and critical role himself. And what the US Deputy NSA has said is absolutely correct that without India, this consensus would not have been arrived at. And without Prime Minister Modi's role, we would not have been able to arrive at a consensus in G20. Very important. This is very big news, viewers, because it's the first time anyone is telling us how this entire agreement was scripted, how consensus was built. Now, a key phrase, and that's a phrase that the Prime Minister used when he was with uh, President Putin of Russia, and he said, this is not a time for war. That phrase was echoed in this particular um, G20 resolution. Talk us through that aspect of it, because yeah. it's not really a slap, but it is definitely counsel, isn't yeah. it? Uh, How so, does Russia react to that? So Rahul, it's, um, it's a very powerful uh, statement that today's era is not an era of war. And diplomacy and dialogue is important. Uh, this was drafted by us, this was brought in by us, and everybody actually accepted it there. But you won't believe it that actually China opposed it. China opposed this. There was a deadlock, deadlock on this for about four days. And finally, 19 out of 20 members said that this statement is critical. It's important. It sends out a message. And this is very important in today's geopolitics. This is the positive line. And therefore, today's era is not an era of war. Was, and diplomacy and dialogue is absolutely critical and important. Was endorsed by everybody. And China backed out of it. So are you saying that India succeeded in isolating China in a critical forum such as G20? We managed to diplomatically, diplomatically isolate China and we managed to ensure that 19 out of the 20 members supported us and finally China also agreed along with the 19 members. So it's very important when you do negotiations of this type that you are managed to bring consensus and when 19 out of 20 members said that this is the most critical statement in that entire statement of G20, then everybody finally followed hands. Well, that's a marvelous achievement, and it tells us a lot really about India's growing stature uh, across the globe. But let me come back to this. Russia obviously would have been directly impacted. A statement such as this going into such an important um, agreement remains one on record. How did the Russians react? Remember, President Putin wasn't there. It was actually Mr. Lavrov who was there representing him. How did that go down with the Russians and how did you sort of bring them on board? So uh, this issue was constantly being discussed on how to find a way out. Because if G20 makes a very political statement, it moves away from its core area, that is economics. And finally, we had to convince G7 that let's go back to the United Nations statement. And we had to convince, firstly, the Russian Sherpa that is better because the UN had already voted in the Security Council. India had abstained. So India's position was brought in by putting the voting pattern. The statement also brings out the voting pattern. That was replicated in that para. And then we had to convince them, and then Mr. Lavrov had to be convinced, and a lot of backdoor negotiations were done for that between the Indonesian foreign minister, Mr. Lavrov, our own minister, Mr. Jayashankar, played a key role, all of them. Many ministers played a key role in the backdoor. While the Sherpa negotiations were done, uh, we had to convince, we had to take Russia also on board. And finally, Russia agreed that the right approach is to go with the UN resolution because that had become public, it, it had already been voted, and the political statement was coming from the United Nations Security Council, and therefore it was acceptable to Russia as well. And then it was finally agreed by China also. So it took four days, actually. It took five days. Five days. Yes, five, five, five days, days of negotiations from 8 o'clock in the morning uh, to 4 o'clock every night, and back again at 8 o'clock. So three hours, of, three hours of work only. And the Prime and Minister was invested in this. The Prime Minister was fully invested in this. Well, viewers, that says a lot, really, as I was saying, about the way in which India is now being viewed by some of the leading economies 
nations of the world. And it's very important because as we take on the presidency, Mr. Kant, and I want to come back to this, as we take on the presidency, there are going to be more challenges such as this. You're going to have the intercession of politics, geopolitics really, with economic issues, given the fact that the Ukraine war is not going away. We've reached a, some sort of an intransigency there. How are you going to ensure that we stay the course on the issues that matter? Yeah. So Rahul, there are many challenges. When India takes over the presidency, let's understand that there's a global turmoil. You know, there's not merely the ge geopolitical crisis, there's a post-COVID era where a huge number of people have gone backward in terms of education, and health, and nutrition. Uh, SDGs, instead of progressing, have regressed. There's a ch huge challenge of global debt. 70 countries across the world are impacted by global debt. And there's a huge China factor in that because China has given debt to many countries which is opaque and non, uh, totally non-transparent. -trans uh, you know, then there is a challenge of uh, climate action. There is a challenge of global supply chains being totally disrupted. 40% of the chip supplies is coming from one country. There's a China-Taiwan issue there. And if something happens there, then the defense, mo mobility, uh, electronics, manufacturing, the whole world will come to a standstill. And therefore, we have, India will take over the presidency at the moment of this crisis. But every crisis is an opportunity. And therefore, being positive, being forward-looking, being progressive is very critical. And therefore, India gets this opportunity to, uh, you know, growth across the world is slowing down. How do we bring in inclusive, resilient growth? How do we accelerate SDG implementation? How do we push for more women-led development? How do we demonstrate the positive narrative which India has built up in terms of digital transformation, which we've done? We've been able to transform digitally. We've done a huge technological leapfrogging. How do we ensure that uh, you know, 4 billion people of the world do not have identity, 2 billion people don't even have a bank account, 133 countries in the world do not have a payment system. How do we take the India model to the rest of the world and ensure that what we've done in terms of direct benefit transfer, in terms of opening bank account, you know, when we op started opening bank account, only 19% of the accounts were women, owned by women. Today, 56% of the accounts are led by women. So therefore, this story of what India has done in the last seven, eight years is a story which needs to be told to the world. Let's talk a little bit about an initiative that India would like to talk about. What is that unique Indian initiative that you want to, uh, at some level or the other, germinate under your presidency, under India's presidency? So two critical things, uh, Rahul, first and foremost is that uh, there's a new study which has just come out by the Bank of International Settlement, BIS, which says that what India achieved in last seven years in uh, terms of digital transformation, it, it would have taken India 46 years to achieve. So what we have done really in terms of transformation digitally, we've built these public tracks on which we've allowed private sector to innovate. We've changed the lives. Number two, we've built huge amount of infrastructure. We've built about three million houses, which is like building a house for every Australian. Uh, every single Australian, we provided water to 24.3 million people, which is like providing ha water connection to every person in uh, Brazil. Or we've provided over 10 million electric con electricity connection, which is like providing electricity connection to everybody in Germany. Or we've, as the Prime Minister said, we've built 55,000 kilometer of roads, which is like making a road almost through three-fourths of Europe. So, or uh, digital payments. We do about 7x the payment of what America and Europe do together. We do 3x the payment of what China does. We do 20% more payment than U USA, Europe, and China do together. So these, this, this story is India's G20 opportunity is an opportunity to tell the world the model of development, the model of digital transformation, the model of health, what we've done. We've become the vaccine capital of the world. We've done uh, vaccination to over two and a half billion people, which is, which is again, almost seven, X, seven and a half X of what USA did. 
which is about 6x of what Europe did. Now, this is a story which needs to be told in terms of India as the health and vaccine capital, India as the digital transformation capital. Most of these most of these innovations have come from the developed part of the world. This is for the first time in the history of post-independent India that transformation and innovation have happened from India, which are being taken to the other parts of the world. How does then it feel when the West lectures us on building this success story, for example, in the recent few months, on blood oil, yeah. Russian oil? You've had so many statements coming through I don't need to acquaint you with some of these statements. There is always a moralizing edge to these statements. How do you react to that? So Europe has actually been uh, the biggest buyer of oil uh, and gas from uh, Russia. So you have a scenario where a country like Germany actually made itself totally dependent on China's import and imports from China and energy from Russia. So. I, d I think we, we just need to move on and do what is in our national interest. We should buy the cheapest oil from wherever it is available. We need to grow and develop. We are an advancing, growing economy. We should do what is in our national interest and move on. Final question to you, Mr. Kant, and this is an important one. Obviously, COVID has set us back and now there's a war. That is also having an impact on India's own recovery. Yes, we are going to be the fastest growing economy amongst the large economies in the world, but we're still not where we want it to be. How do you see this emerging, this scenario of the last one year? Is it absolutely impossible to predict right now? Uh, Rahul, I'm absolutely sure that uh, the next three decade are India's decade. Uh, they are the, going to be India's decades in terms of growth, in terms of progress, in terms of accelerating reforms. And I am absolutely sure that India must accelerate the pace of its reforms, which it is doing. Demographics are on our side. We co will continue to be the fastest large growing economy. We should focus through the PLIs on manufacturing. We should make ourselves easy and simple as we go along. And there's no way that we'll not become a 35 to 40 trillion economy by 2047, simply because we need to ensure that our rate of growth must continue to accelerate year after year, year after year, and we must keep getting into sunrise areas of growth. We must focus on electronics, we must focus on advanced chemistry cell battery, we must focus on uh, electric vehicle, we must focus on green hydrogen. These are the areas which are going to give you big trajectory of growth in the coming years. And that is what will make ensure that the next three decades till 2047 will be India's decades. Three challenges to this growth story for uh, the viewers here? What do you think they are? Well, first and foremost, I think most critical is that India must urbanize in a sustainable manner. Urbanization and manufacturing-led urbanization will give you the growth in a big way. The second key thing is that we need 12 to 13 states which grow at high rates. And we need large populated states like UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, all to grow rapidly to take India's growth story in a very big way. And the third is that this is the opportunity to make India the easiest and the simplest and the most reforming country in the world. We must continue this trajectory which has been set in by the Prime Minister of simplicity, easiness, because the private sector must drive India's growth story and government should only be a facilitator and a catalyst. Amitabh Khan, wonderful to speak with you on your vision for G20 and of course India's growth story. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you so much, Rahul and Sri Amitabh Kant. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause, please.